Hello. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? Good. All right. Well, everyone, welcome to episode 13 of The Harvest, where we discuss everything cinema and story. And as we learn, you learn. As we grow, you grow. My name is Xavier Garcia. And I'm Jonathan Garcia. So today, we will be discussing our experiences with the changes in digital cinema trends, particularly the hows, whats, and whens to properly incorporate VFX, but more importantly, why. Why it should or shouldn't be used in your indie film projects. We'll talk about authenticity in your storytelling, as well as exploring industry advancements and groundbreaking examples of VFX in specific films across genres. You ready for this? Yeah, sounds fun. All right, let's do it. So, first and foremost, Jonathan, because we're talking about VFX, and I, you know, kind of our resident VFX expert, uh, having yourself been a VFX um, you know, director and, sure. and you know, producer and yourself involved in a lot of VFX editing, can you just give us kind of like a brief understanding of VFX so that as we talk about it, people will have some sort of a baseline to know, okay, what are these guys you know, getting into? Here? Sure, so VFX, uh, short for visual effects, um, and it's basically uh, manipulating or creating imagery, um, uh, you know, and splicing that into a live shot, you know, either in the back or just recreating it outside of a live shot. And it doesn't limit it to just, for example, architecture it could be nat nature environments right. it could be you know set extension yeah. it could be people animals i mean it's just manipulating right. I mean, vfx the image. extends as far as cgi which is computer generated images and um you know it could be 2d 3d um you know there's uh different types of styles for visual effects um it's it's a big world it's yeah, a whole it other world outside of just live action shows. it is huge so how does one begin entering into that world yeah i mean um you know it it you have to have the passion yeah. for that um because it's uh, you're literally behind a computer <laughs> your whole you life. You live it. You live back there. Yeah, um, and you gotta love it. Uh, you know, obviously there are great schools uh, that offer great programs for visual yeah. effects. I went to um, UMass Dartmouth, which uh, opened up a program for motion graphics, which entered me into the world of VFX. Um, uh, I mean. There's so many things inside that world, but I think it's the beginning part of it is you just got to love it. Yeah. You got to, um, you know, you, you, once you watch a movie and you begin to see the world come to life and be able to, you know, wow, that, how was that made? Once you start asking those questions, I think that you're, you're already creating some sort of uh, desire inside of you to try to figure out and discover what it's all about. Yeah, I, speaking of schools, I mean, there's there are specific places that even specialize just in VFX uh, education, like the Nomon School, I, I believe it is. It's mm. in Canada mm -hmm. where, like, I mean, I, I follow them on Instagram and some of the stuff that the students are doing there. And these are just students, and they're doing some high-level things. I think that as technology progresses, the capacity and ability for even someone just in their basement mm -hmm. on without uh, a degree or an education can actually get into some pretty sophisticated VFX work right yeah. I mean the technology is just it's becoming so so user friendly mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I think uh, the technology that's out there it's not only becoming so user friendly but it's becoming free you know yeah. there's free tools out there for you to right now start playing around with in your home such as so uh there's programs that i know that i've started manipulating with uh blender blender is um, awesome there's also other software open community right blender right. so like anyone yeah. can pour into it advance it tweak absolutely. it absolutely absolutely okay. um and then um you know there are there are programs that offer you 30 you know 30 30 months free or um a light version for you to start manipulating with for instance in davinci resolve uh, yeah that's right the fusion um, uh, app is free, uh, 2K yeah. free. Um, you yeah. won't render eight, uh, 4K, but you know you can start dabbling and learning yeah, how absolutely. to do nodes, and the, you know you'll learn node-based programs versus layer-based programs, and so you know uh, it's a big world, like I said, um, but um, there's so much you can do with it, and I think that that's where we're kind of heading. So yeah, it it really is. It absolutely really is, and I think if anything. COVID-19 has showed us that 
because of the because of the risk, for example, of a second outbreak and just all of the new de CDC demands on you know uh, productions and just how people can gather and get together. I think what we've realized um, is that places like animation has hasn't been affected, although it has. It hasn't been affected nearly as much as like the live action production companies, you know. I, I've been listening to some podcasts and just listening to kind of, you know, for example, Pixar. Essentially, just they continued almost seamlessly doing their work at home. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's you know that's animation and it's and it's kind of like a subdivision of the of the VFX right. world or rather a world in and of itself. Um, nevertheless, you know, just the ability to create story by manipulating all aspects of what is visual just on your computer is a growing trend. It is becoming easier. It is becoming more available, more accessible. And you can tell some great stories just, you know, by, okay, a, one person alone in the woods, you know I mean? I'm thinking I am legend, you know, and like, and now you've got VFX available to you. You can add all of the dynamic conflicts against that protagonist that you want and actually have a compelling story because you now have these tools that make, you know, for example, like if you want it to be a man, man against nature, right. you can do that. You can do mm -hmm. that with VFX. Um, I, I'm, I'm wild. I'm floored by what is what is possible. Yeah, I think we're at a time right now where VFX is kind of pushing the envelope where we're going as far as, and we discussed this yeah, talking one of our about, past episodes, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, using the, uh, the likeness of individuals, but not only just using the likeness of people, um, but also able to splice different faces on people, uh, oh, yeah. which is just a whole other yeah. crazy world of, of VFX, which is called deep fake. Yeah, the deep fake well, stuff is creepy, man. Yeah, it is. It's 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 dangerous. It it's is very dangerous. It is. Um, I was watching. Like, remember you and I had an argument not too long ago about Tom Cruise. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, this is Tom Cruise. Oh You're like, it's not Tom Cruise, bro. Look at the like, look at the syn idiosyncrasies. And I'm like, it is, it is, this right. is him. Yeah. And I was so convinced. Like, you could easily just throw anyone. Like, you know, God forbid, someone's like, oh, President of the United States, press a nuke. It's his face. You know, like. Yeah. Well, I knew, I knew we were into something when Snickers created a commercial. And they did the Brady Bunch, and they recreated the Brady oh, Bunch. Oh, yeah, with Danny and, Trejo. <laughs> yeah, and oh no, no, I'm thinking yeah, of the. No, you're is right. that the one? Yeah, where Danny Trejo comes out and and says an act, and he slams an axe <laughs> onto the uh, onto the table. Yeah, I knew that we were into something very serious when they were able to go back into old footage and be able to manipulate yes. the content and put yourself inside and yeah. and and into the world of how can we start splicing people into. Um, into you know Old. locations, and then how can we start yeah. splicing faces into people? You know, and so it, it was it was very revolutionary that. Oh, that I remember that. Film. How many Super Bowls ago was that? Two or three? I, I believe. Uh, so, either yeah. way, I, I mean, I remember seeing that, and I was just like, that was by far my yeah. favorite commercial yeah. because, well, first of all, it incorporated you know humor, great storytelling, but it was groundbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. Visually, I was just like, how did they manipulate the Brady Bunch like that and sneak? Danny Trejo into this commercial. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, I mean, yeah. it was awesome. Yeah, it was. It was great to see how they were able to, um, you know, recreate, you know, the, the words into the Brady Bunch to be able to, you know, communicate what was needed to be said on script. Yeah. 2015 you know? Super Bowl 2015. Yeah. yeah, I think that's what it was. So I know we were into something then, um, and it was just only going to get faster. And also become less expensive. Yes, and that's that's a big deal. So, all right, now we're talking about VFX. We're talking about the 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 expenditure and what it costs. Before we jump into like numbers and whatnot, right. let's talk a little bit about how we've been able to create a VFX group in order to specifically handle some of the more low grade demands mm -hmm. of the films that we've been creating. Because there are ways around. Although VFX is inherently an extremely expensive world. It's just look, it's. It's time, yeah. it's technology, it's storage. I mean, all of that just costs tons of money. But there are ways such as sure. him. Yeah. If you could give a little bit of background about like the, the need for him, like what, what is the, you yeah, know, so the, the story when we, there? Um, when we jumped into one of our films, just like uh, George Lucas, you know, you realize that you kind of need to do it yourself. Yeah. Um, one for us budget, two was being able to control what we wanted 
to do instead of giving it out to another uh, company out there. So what we did is Mount Harvest opened up another branch, which was Hem VFX Group, and right. we work with VFX artists literally around the world. Yeah, literally. And um, and they we collaborate through different means, different sources um, um, that we use, which will be my tip of the week. Uh, so I don't want to say it now. Um, <laughs> so, but you know, we 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 work very well, um, and we were able to um, you know collaborate on trying to create CG, yeah, so, 3D, and, you know, VFX elements, uh, create 3D elements and stuff like that. So, so. I want to give a little bit of background on what sure. happened and what led to the creation of him. Yeah. So we were working on a blood throne, and we were recreating some first century Jerusalem building architecture, homes, internal, external, set extensions. I mean, there was a ton of stuff on there. Now, if we did our job well, you can't tell, but there was a ton. Not that we wanted to, it was just, look, we were doing first century Jerusalem in 21st century New England, and so there's only so much you can do in order to maintain authenticity and make this world look believable and real, and so we're like, okay, we're just, we're gonna have to bust out the chroma, mm -hmm. you know, the chroma screens and, and, and green screen, blue screen, you know, all of these sets. Nevertheless, in the process of shopping locations, places, houses, VFX houses that could help us do all of the work that we did, we found, well, number one, price, mm -hmm. expensive. Right. And number two, you nailed it, which I didn't even think about, just like the creative control. Mm -hmm. um, which is precisely why George Lucas launched ILM, you know, right. as he's thinking about all of the VFX that needed to go into Star Wars. Yeah. It's like he wanted it to be a very specific He was the way. only one who had the, the, mind, vision yeah, the, mind. the vision in the mind. Yeah, the vision, exactly. Had it all in the mind. So for him to be able to get that and give it to someone else was going to be very difficult. Right. And so we were like, okay, how do we communicate? I mean, because a Blood Throne was almost like a year and a half worth of, worth of research, maybe more, mm -hmm. right? It's like, how do we communicate everything that we want? to someone else whom is just like collecting a paycheck, wants to get in and get it done as quickly as possible because first and foremost, one thing that we're realizing is that VFX is very hard to be profitable with. Mm -hmm. oh, you yeah. need tons of projects across the board because if you're a small house, especially in like a, a shaky economy, you're not gonna last. And that's the thing, it's, and also it's like the turnaround time for some of these elements that are requested in the industry takes so long because of rendering right You're having to render and process this this computer information uh it takes a long time and so you need a large team yeah. to take parts of the build for yeah. the yeah. 3d content and because of time time equals money and yeah. it, it just becomes expensive and yeah. so we realized well first and foremost these groups that we were reaching out to so amazing, amazing companies, mm -hmm. you know, out of Atlanta, out of LA, um, were phenomenal with us being as fair as they possibly could, understanding like the, the project, the, the scope of the project, the size. They loved the story and they were willing and wanting to help and trying to beat the price as best as they could. But one thing came down to it is that it was just one of their many and they needed to get in and get out in order for them to not lose money and we got that we're like look we don't want this project to be a hindrance for your operations mm -hmm. and so after we lay all down you know and looked at it we're like okay we're just gonna have to do this ourselves but we can't yeah. and so him became a collective yeah. of individuals like-minded that have a love for storytelling themselves wanting to you know um, gain recognition for their work. We connected with Composite Media GBR out of uh, Germany, mm -hmm. um, and we worked with Germany. We were working with Puerto Rico. You know, we were working like literally across the world, building a network of VFX artists in New England and all you know across the the Atlantic, right. in order to build the a blood throne world. Right, and that's the great thing about him is, um, you know, it's, uh, it gives an opportunity for freelancers to come in for a project and really yeah. um, join the team to try to produce a project. Whereas, you know, a lot of these big um, VFX companies, you know, they work with their guys and that's their team because they know how to communicate what they want and, um, and the pipeline is very difficult to yeah. try to process. The pipeline yeah. being how to work with one another from different levels of transferring content um, to different programs, how, which ones work with each other, um, files, you know, like textures, models, uh, 
simulations. Um, there's different types of things that go inside. Let's put it this way. As you see so many departments inside of a film production, you have so many departments inside. Yeah, uh, tons. VFX department. Tons, tons. And it's because of that that oftentimes, you know, some of these VFX companies that that emerge are, you know, attached to like a series of films mm -hmm. that are happening. Like, for example, you know, ILM emerged because the Star Wars universe and countless of films that could have been, that were going to be created. Mm -hmm. I mean, George Lucas's brain behind this entire world with its own languages and its own race and its own people and all yeah, of that. Yeah. He, this was, this company was not, you know, it was being built with a long-term thought and approach in mind. And so it was because of that, that it was, it is sustainable. And now, well, now it's like, it's the company that brought to us Star Wars. And so it has built such clout and has attracted the greatest minds in computer animation and graphics and design yeah. and all that. And so now they can afford to, because they're the top, mm -hmm. um, to, to sustain the amount of, I mean, look, when you, when you watch a film and you watch the film credits and you look when it gets to yeah. the VFX right. department and you see like the seven columns, the eight columns across with like names that are tiny, you know, like eight font. Like, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a standard font, but like you see all these names just scrolling. All those people are paid, you know, full yeah. salaries for the work. And then there's that amount in companies right. of scrolling. Right. You know, it's just, you know, you got this company and that company from this place and that place that all are involved inside the film. So talking a couple of examples, right? Um, just going through my notes. The Jungle Book, the remake, the 2017 remake, that film was almost entirely created in a computer. Now, yeah. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure what the budget was for it, but I do know that it collected over $100 million in the box office, mm -hmm. right? And it's opening, just in its opening weekend. So with VFX, like measuring the pluses and the minuses, because it's a huge gamble, yeah. right? Pouring in money on a VFX, in, into like a film from a VFX perspective, um, and then it like bombing. I mean, it takes a lot of money. Yeah. Now, Jungle Book is a great example of like a success, right? Sure. I mean, 100 plus million on an opening weekend, but um, it can go drastically the other way. Yeah, I think it's, you know, you're, you're, you're weighing your risks and reward uh, when it comes to VFX, uh, your turnaround time, um, your budget, obviously. Um, but one of the things about Jungle Book, one of the things that they brought into the table, and other, and other films like Oblivion and Gravity, they work with a system called uh, image projection, I believe I'm saying yep, it right? Yep, 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 yep. And, it, and basically what it is, it's, you know, it's a big screen. Yeah, uh, which uh, is awesome. I think showing, that, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, because, you know, you're actually putting the world already while the actors are there in Let's the talk a little bit about that, because that's VFX, um... Oh, that is VFX. Yeah. It's yeah. VFX. You're, sure. you're bringing, because what is on the projection, like let's talk about Oblivion for a second, which personally from a visual perspective is one of my favorite movies because just visually it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, the when they're in their home mm -hmm. and that whole sky and all that's happening, that's just a huge projection, all 360 all around that. Yeah. Now, they were placed inside this set, practical, glass, made beautifully interiors right with this vfx world on the outside what that does for the actor is it's so and i you know and i'm talking even from like an actor's perspective it's so helpful mm -hmm. than if you're looking out there and it's just like this bright green that you're staring at yeah uh, it's just i well, feel you, like it just adds it's, the authenticity it's awesome because you let's put it this way as for pre-production people it's already done Right, so you're not going into pre-production in a sense, going in there and creating VFX. Mm -hmm. You know, it's VFX that are done pre. So the team in Oblivion, what they did was a group of uh, cinematographers went up to a high mountain. I don't know where. I'm blanking out right now, but they filmed clouds. They filmed cloud movements, 360 perspective, and then they have that amazing 4K footage, and then they spliced it into a big screen uh, just outside the house. And so it looks very real. Yeah. You know, uh, it, you have to have great technology to make it look real. Sure. 
And um, and then, you know, you got your live shot and that's it. You're not taking it back to pre and you're creating any VFX. It's all there for the actor to take. Unlike green screen or blue screen where you're like, you're acting in front of something where you have an idea of, you create it in your mind, but it's not there with you. So, um, so which is a lot harder. And I think um, based off hearing certain uh, comments by um, Hollywood actors, you know, uh, not many people are a fan of it. Not many people are a fan of being in front of a green screen, blue screen, you yeah, know, and just try to act. Yeah, yeah it's, because it's 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 they're talented beyond belief. But it's also you know they're working with their imagination, you right. know, and so instead of it being hands on. So yeah, it's, it's, it's it's a great technology, image projection, which uh, Jungle Book really m mastered. Um, Oblivion. Uh, Oblivion uh, worked on it, uh, but also Jungle Book worked on it as well. Yeah. And um, and Gravity did an awesome Gravity, job. Yes, Gravity, which got an Oscar sure. for that, um, yes. where, you know, um, Sandra Bullock really did an awesome job performing. In and But see, that, like, that Oscar, and look, I could be wrong, but I... I feel like because she was immersed in the environment and they gave her the visuals to work with, it's as close to practical as you can get. I mean, she was as close to being in space as yeah. you can get and therefore her acting inside this visual breathtaking world was phenomenal. I just feel like there's something to be said about the... Um, taking VFX and making it as flawlessly integrated into your film as possible, you know, even like, for example, with the projection, it is almost like just taking practical a step further. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't like, okay, let's just put everyone inside a green screen mm -hmm. um, square room or a psych, you know, green mm -hmm. screen backdrop and like just say, this is what you're seeing over here. This is what you're seeing over there. This is what would potentially be in this area and pretend that you're doing this, this and that, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, you know, uh, but I'll tell you what, one thing across the board, despite whether or not it's projection or it is just a bare room, planning, planning, planning ahead of schedule is super important. Yeah. You know, even talking about the numbers, you know, like just a lot of this stuff is going to cost money. And if it isn't like planned to the T, and even for indie filmmakers where you're thinking about just like, okay, we're gonna put a set extension here, like, oh, we'll fix it in post type of thing, like that mentality, you gotta be careful because it, it will bite you in the butt. Yeah. It costs a lot of money, yeah. even on the back end. Yeah. Thinking, oh, we'll save time now, so we're saving money now, and we'll fix it later. It does, like, with the amount of time that you're going to be spent in, in post production, that's why a ton of indie films just don't get completed. Right. Because people have that, oh, we'll fix it in post, and then like, Six years later, they're still in post trying to fix it when if they had planned ahead of schedule and had planned the VFX process into their production, had brought in a post-production supervisor and a VFX uh, you know, uh, department to kind of be on set with the art department to plan these things out, like it could be smooth, it could be quick, and it doesn't have to be this crazy dollar value, at least for us in the indie world, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Am absolutely. I wrong? No, I think, I think that's spot on. Every... Everything in filmmaking has to be looked at in pre-production um, and even research and development even sooner than that just to try to have the fullest control uh, uh, and also the best outcome for your film. Now, what is happening as a result of changing trends in cinema is, um, I don't know if you guys have seen it, I don't know if you've had a chance to check it out yet, but Unreal Engine um, has just launched there i mean it is breathtaking mm -hmm. i don't know if you've seen some of the like the game footage yeah and uh i mean it's 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 almost it's not quite photorealistic yet i mean they call it photorealism because that's the closest to like real that you can but like when you look at it there's still certain elements certain things like yeah. gravity just Gravity hasn't been figured Gra out yet. Gravity, skin, skin tones. Um, you know, I, I know ILM has done a phenomenal job with skin tones, but still, um, there's still a plastic the, the stretching feel to of it. the skin. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the details, the pores, the hairs. Uh, that stuff is still yet. You you can still tell, um, especially in video games. You could still tell that it's it hasn't you know the hairs you have to differentiate between you know that you got to scatter the hairs and how they scatter is too you can see the patterns yeah and 
you know, it, it you, there isn't, uh, um, you know, the uniqueness of fine, you know, hairs that, you know, yeah, that, and that then, we have. and even the like the, how environment affects that those types of movements, right, you know, exactly. like whether it's the subtle winds or I mean, gravity in and of itself, you know, right. like just how it falls, how yeah, things yeah, fall, the physics how things, of everything, the physics, yeah, there, that's yeah. still, but I'm, but I mean, man, like Unreal Engine, what the capacity that that opens up for filmmakers being able to see 3D in real time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's a crew, so there's a, there's, a, there's a person standing in a room, in a green screen room, and there's a crew holding the camera, filming, and as they are filming, they are seeing the 3D world, the 3D environment already being projected into the camera right so um so that's also some of the technology i think jungle book i i, I might be getting some stuff confused but i know that jungle book also used that technology uh pretty on so it was uh so they had a um a a camera system um where they would move where some cinema uh, dp would move and uh it would react inside of the 3d world um, which obviously, you know, blew up into all these different areas into video game creation where, you know, Unreal Engine is picked up and you have people, YouTubers and, you know, industry professionals like uh, Matt Workman. Yeah, from, right here, uh, local. Yeah, Cambridge. yeah, from Cambridge. Um, you know, really exploring uh, that world because yeah. I believe it's definitely going to be something that is going to expand in the next few years. I, hate- I mean, it's, I mean, it, how... No, I mean the technology of you being able to manipulate you having you being able to be a DP in a 3D world is just so. That's cool. crazy, yeah. right? I mean, that 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 it helps to yeah. be able to see it, you know. Instead of saying, "Okay, let me use my mind's eye. I'm gonna shoot like this," it's like, no, you're seeing it as is. It's almost like the jump from film analog to you know, like what we're doing now, the digital world, mm-hmm. you know. It's that I feel like it's it's gonna be that same type of jump where even now like when you as a DP I'm sure you've like as you're like training up um, camera ops and and potential cinematographers talking to them about the basics of exposure and the basics of understanding you know like Opposite. how the camera yeah. works yeah. you know like what is the aperture what is mm-hmm. because sometimes people just put on that auto feature right or or like the camera just does so much for you Mm -hmm. or you're able to like with metadata you know manipulate so much of that in post that people don't even learn like the basics of like exposure of light of you know i mean even like uh you know like having had i personally i you know i was i was so fortunate of having had the opportunity to actually develop film and work in a dark room and develop film and get a feel for like you know what different chemicals do and what is a bleach bypass and what you know so that when you're then coloring and in this 3d world or rather in this digital world like you're understanding where it comes from i mean even you yourself Mm -hmm. as a designer you had to understand our history before they threw you into a computer in order to like go into design right and so it's like we are slowly crossing the threshold with unreal engine where we're kind of like passing almost this uh into this like new generation of of filmmaking and of cinema and there's so much here that still needs to be learned i feel like technology is moving so fast yeah yeah that we still haven't even learned everything that is like that we're capable of doing with what we have now we're already at like that next generation Mm -hmm. yeah everything that is developed in the future comes from that pre-created or, or past elements, sure, you course. know, where that's, you know, why, why do you need to be able to hold this thing to move around inside of a 3D world? Well, that's where the DPs, you know, their movement, you know, it's going to be interesting now starting to see, uh, you know, this very light um, camera uh, piece technology being strapped onto a steady cam system for 3D world, you yeah. know, like how are you going to you know some light balance? You don't really need... <laughs> You know, yeah. that to, to balance something so light, you know, so it's like, you know, what are the new technologies of stabilization are they going to bring into You're the world? You're going to have to innovate. Yeah, because yeah. the technology is so small and light that, you know, how do you stabilize that, you know? Right. So. And I mean, look, it's also it's also compartmentalizing some of the industry known positions like the DP is slowly getting split because the DP is no longer 
I mean, yes, he. I mean, I. I don't know how things will develop down the road, but as of right now, the DP still has the final say when it comes to like how how is this. Well, the director does, but the DP is going to determine how is this backdrop going to be lit so that the the mood of you know what the shot, intended. the scene, yep. like what's intended, the character, like what's happening, you know. Um, but now you've got the the three D artist. You know, or or the the supervisor, you know, that is lighting that 3D world, that 3D background, mm-hmm. working with the DP because some of this technology, you know, with the current standing DPs, like that technology is over their heads, and so they're bringing in teams right. to work alongside with them yeah. to help them along well, the it's process. Great. It's creating more jobs. That's true. You know, in That's the industry, true. and um, it's it's you know creating more specialists in, yeah. in, in, in which is always good departments yeah which is always good yeah um you know and I, and I was i was actually really interested in seeing you know like as i was exploring some of unreal engine and just seeing you know matt workman involved and engaged in that you know from here he's like yeah, down yeah. the street from yeah. us yeah. Yeah. which is pretty cool um he having him like just watching his process of creating cinetracer yeah and seeing how yeah. cinetracer can even be used as a previous program right um, well, that's which, that's essentially what it is. It, it, that's what he intended it to be: is for uh, being able to, as best as you can, uh, create three D elements that can be an expression of what your shot is going to be day of shoot. Yeah, and that's what it is. And that's and that goes back to one of our favorite pastimes: the planning, yeah. <laughs> the planning process. Yeah. Um, and that is that is great because new tools are opening up for filmmakers right. to be able to do storytelling excellent. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't get rid of certain tools, you know, like top-down shots where you're kind of showing uh, diagrams of where the camera is going to be and where the lights are going to be and how the, the, you know, like some sort of like blueprint of the set. You know, it doesn't get rid of those older, older tools. Um, it actually enhances um, your uh, creative process because now you're actually visually showing whether a client uh, or your director, the scene, how it get lit, how the lights uh, are being used, um, how the walls can be painted, you can move around certain elements. You're re- literally creating the 3D scene uh, on the program, and yeah. it's really, really cool. It is. Now, let's talk a little bit personal. You personally, because like we all have our own opinions. I mean, at the end of the day, we step back as filmmakers, we look at it and we say, you know what, innovation is great. Mm-hmm. Change is always good. Um, for me personally, because it just it challenges us. It challenges us as filmmakers and storytellers to adapt, to grow, to become better. However, are you the type of person that rather go practical, or are you embracing the like all that VFX has to offer? If you had to choose, if you had to make a choice, one way or the other, which way would you? Which That's way would tough. You That's really tough. Um, you know. I love the VFX world. Yeah. And nonetheless, if I can tell my story, um, uh, it would, it, that would be number one. Whichever element helps me best tell my story. Yeah. Good. Um, Good answer. I think that, you know, um, if no effects, then I'm sure the line producer will like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if I could tell the story that way, then that's how I'm going to pursue it. Um, ideally, I've... In the past, we've obviously, you know, when you're entering into the world of film for the first time and you're encountering a lot of road bumps, you're like, I don't want to deal with this stuff again. But um, when you have the budget, when you have the team, um, you know, go in, uh, take advantage of all that it offers, you know, the VFX world. Um, That way you can really be able to think outside the box from what you had originally envisioned with practical Versus, you know, here's this whole world you can create with VFX. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you're gonna have you're gonna have creatives on both ends of the spectrums. You've got your Christopher Nolans that say, you know, like, nope, I'm gonna go as practical as I possibly can. Oh, you need you need a couple like hundred thousand extras on the beach. You know, like leaving Dunkirk. Okay, cardboard. Right. We're gonna use cardboard. We're gonna go as cardboard people because <laughs> I am not gonna put that in as 3D people. And you know what? He used cardboard people that were getting soggy, and they were getting, yeah. but it was it worked. Right, it right. worked. And half of these shots are only like one second, two seconds long. You know, it worked. And so you're not, you know, you're, you're granted they're 24 frames in a second if you're not doing slow motion. So yeah. it's a lot of frames you got to edit. But that's that's really the reason. It's like you know, I just want to have my content 
in the yeah. scene. Yeah, he, and he, I mean, another famous example, you know, doing Interstellar, it's like, okay, are we going to virtually create the vast expanse of this cornfield? He's like, nope, we're going to plant corn. We're going to grow hundreds of thousands of acres of corn. We're going to drive the car through it. And when we're done, we're going to sell the corn. And the film actually made a, uh, they made a profit on that corn, which yeah. is crazy. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's just brilliant. It's yeah, just brilliant. it is. And you know what? I think, I think you said it best. And I agree with you. I think, look, there's always a tool for the job. Yeah. There's always a tool for the job, and sometimes, you know, like the carpenter that's wielding around the hammer and the screwdriver and the nails and the screws may not want to use, you know, like that, you know, that digital technology, mm -hmm. you know, like that next um, advancement in technology because they want to work with their hands. And, you know, sometimes we, we become, you know, creatures of habit and like, no, we want. But whatever it takes. Yeah. to tell the story right. right. If you need a set extension, like for us, you know, first century AD Jerusalem, you know, like we're in New England. Mm -hmm. We need to, there's no architecture here that it, in any way, shape or form is going to resemble the palaces of Masada, you know, back in the year, what was that? Like 20 BCE, um, 30 BCE, whatever it is. And so we needed to use VFX in order to do that, in order to tell our story, and in order to tell it authentically. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Whether it's practical for authenticity, or it's VFX using VFX in order to enhance, you know, the authentic feel, the the vibe, the nature, the 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 texture, the the grains of that world. Then mm -hmm. you got to use that. You got to mm -hmm. do it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Sweet. And now, I mean, not to mention like what 5g the 5g network now there's everyone that like lives on both ends of the spectrum of the 5g network You're like oh it's going to cause disease and kill people's you know brain cells but then there but then there's like let, let's look at it from a filmmaker's perspective like the ability to render and transfer footage right. at 5g it's almost like you're going to be able to transfer it in real time right well i always say risk versus reward <laughs> what, what's it going to be you know i know we're we risking too much or right. for a reward just or... for that slightly faster told yeah. story yeah. just a few hundred thousand brain yeah. cells can die yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. exactly so yeah. i mean um the technology um because of because there's a demand yeah um, there's a greater and greater increasing demand for content we're yeah. consuming faster it like, Cheaper. Like savages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, now we talked about um, a blood throne. Let's talk just a little bit about the VFX in Underground. Tell me a little bit about, you know, the process, the idea behind um, the choices that were made, just so that we can, you know, con you know, talk a little bit concretely about just kind of using and exploring VFX in film in order to tell story. If you could just so, talk a little bit about um, it. So... One of the things we realize over past projects, um, for instance, um, as far as um, Crossroad, um, oh yeah, we, Let's start we did there. some we did some VFX work. Actually, we even did a, a, some a, a animation, but we scratched that. Um, <laughs> um, and we because yes, we, we wanted to actually create the temple in the distance. Uh, we wanted yeah. to also create a, a city, a village. A village and um, it turned out nice um, it really did yeah it turned and that out. was uh, kind of like one of your first major narrative wor works for VFX I mean you had done a lot of stuff for commercial stuff but for narrative film that was yeah. like the first time but there but you know when you encounter those things for the first time there are roadblocks you know Always. there are challenges um, and so when we're approaching you know crossroad then up under uh, then uh, a blood throne and then we arrive to underground we're like listen We've experienced all these things. We've we have all of our bumps and bruises. They've been healed. So let's not go into a similar um, issue yeah. because obviously budget, uh, turnaround time, um, and a slew of other uh, concerns. We still knew that we needed to have an environment that was real to the time. So a really good element for people who are dabbling with graphics is learning uh, the set extension form of uh, CGI because it's um, one of the great things is uh, there's a lot of great software out there I can name a whole bunch of them but at the end of the day um, you know architecture is probably the easiest thing to add into your backgrounds into your uh, into your uh, live action shots um, and that's kind of where we wanted to go as far with underground. We wanted to make everything as authentic, as practical as possible, especially inside the, the warehouse. 
uh, scene. But when we were outdoor, all of that was uh, set extensions. Um, and, you know, there's certain 3D, you know, there's a 3D boat and there's uh, the water, um, which was actually um, real water, just a clip, um, a layered, um, which is, you know, um, another thing um, that um, we dabble in is getting clips, live clips of real things to yes. put inside the background. Yes. They're flat, you know, um, but if you're angling directly at them, you know, they're, they look like they're 3D. Um, and being able to incorporate that, incorporate that stuff into a scene, having movement inside to make it come alive and make it real. That's kind of what we did with, um, with Underground. So there's a shot of uh, entering into the city of New Bedford. Um, we have Rose Alley. Mm -hmm. which is real, um, mm -hmm. still existent to yep. this day. Um, but at the end of the building that looks 1850 uh, before it, at the end of that is just, you know, modern day, you know, like yeah, cars yeah, yeah. and parking lot. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> and so we're like, all right, we'll, we'll Light, put a green signs, screen there. Flower, and from there, pots. we'll just create the set extension. And, and uh, we found awesome uh, sketches um, on Pinterest uh, of yeah. what it was in the 1850s. Yeah. We're like, this is perfect. Let's add that as a set extension. Yeah. So we started modeling and 3D it, and there we go. We have our, our scene. And the great thing is about set extensions is you have the elements inside the world to help you create those elements, those 3D. So you have, you know, the cobblestone floor, which, you know, you take pictures of and you, yeah. you, yeah, you, you get those that textures. source material. Exactly. You see how the light hits it and you don't have to go crazy recreating it. You could just take those textures and bring them into your program, and then boom, you have you can continue on the street from there. So I feel like that set extension uh, is probably the easiest form of entering into the CGI world yeah. for for uh, VFX. What are some tools that were helpful for you? Um, that you know, some things that you learned. That, you know, some tools that were helpful for you in order to make the the VFX work. Because look, Underground was actually edited really quickly. In comparison to a blood throne, yeah. Granted, a blood throne was like four times the the length. You know, it's like a it was a originally a forty five minute film that we edited it down, um, but it was also a, a lot more hands on. You know, there were more workers in the post production office. You know, working on a blood throne. On underground, it was very few, mm -hmm. and it was quick. And although it's only a ten minute film, I mean, it was a quick turnaround. So clearly, there was a learning curve there. Yeah, you know, there were some things, some tools. That, and some individuals and people um, that were added to the team that helped that process. There were some things that were done in pre-production, production, production right. and in post. Just one or two tips that could help you know anyone that wants to either get into it or they themselves want to get better at you know including sure. VFX in their films. Yeah, um, in the past I've talked about different channels on YouTube that will help you know what it entails to be a VFX artist on set. Um, but exactly that, uh, a, a, a VFX supervisor yeah, on set. super important. Um, Goodness. Be, having someone focused on uh, making sure that all the elements necessary for you to take this and post are available yeah. um, is, is accomplished. Yeah. You know? um, and I think that that's one of the things that we made sure, as long as we have a VFX supervisor which I helped along with someone else um, that were able to kind of make sure, hey, I need this, 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 this yeah. checklist is done, um, you know. Yeah, so that, 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 was was, that, was, that was key because for Blood Throne, um, it was uh, just, you know, yeah. DP and some crew members are just yeah. like trying to remember what it was. What lens did you use? Uh, you know, what was, you know, like, yeah, what was the I focus? Yeah, I think the script like, supervisor yeah, yeah. was, was All that out, stuff, what, exactly. What got and so, so there's a lot. There's a major list of things, uh, which I mentioned before. Hugo Desk was a good help for me, which yeah. is a YouTube channel guy who just kind of explains all the tools you need, all the, all, all the of your trinkets yeah, and exactly, the, exactly. The gadgets. knowing perfect gray and, and reflections and equipment to use for HDR lighting. And I've talked about it, that in tips before. Cool. Well, you know, if you have any other questions about VFX stuff, um, feel free at any point with any of the episodes that you have, just send those questions out to us, info at mileharvest.com, because like, these are great discussion points, and oftentimes we begin things with a question and just kind of trail off into a topic. Sure. But that is it for our discussion. We are now at our Creators Tip of the Week, 
We didn't have one last week because we had a special episode. Right. We did the crew roundtable discussion, which was really fun. Yeah. That was yeah. really great. It's always awesome to be able to hear, you know, like kind of, for me, it almost serves as like a post-mortem, you know, to be able to hear the crew talk about their experiences on the project. Thank yeah. you guys so yes, much. thank you. Um, I appreciate the touching words even um, of like what it was like to work with us on set. Um, it is duly and twice our honor to be able to have worked with you guys, such an amazing and talented group of crew members. And um, so thank you all. Um, but as far as Creators Tip of the Week, we skipped last week. We've got one this week. Yeah, so um, earlier I was discussing um, how to collaborate. And um, one of the applications we use um, it was Frame.io. Oh, uh, yeah. Frame.io was a really, go uh, really good uh, tool to yeah. be able to, um, you know, work with teams from around the world uh, to give us content. We would be able to edit and make notes on it, send it back. It was a really great pipeline um, in the VFX world. And there are others. Um, Frame.io. But Frame.io was the one that worked for us. Um, and um, I would go check it out. They would probably do a better job explaining them. Yeah, uh, and it's really cool too because it can, I mean, it's great for collaborative work, mm -hmm. but it's also if there's ever a client, um, you know, um, client worker relationship where you have to make presentations for the client i mean it allows them to make notes mm -hmm. to give back feedback you know yeah. and so it's a great way to like streamline conversation right. dialogue with the client especially you know if you're trying to like get some proofs over to a client to see and approve and whatnot yeah, yeah. yeah. Frame IO. It was great. It was really interesting for us too because working with Germany, like there's that six hour time difference. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like they were awake, we were asleep, and then the next morning we'd wake up with all these proofs in our inbox. Yeah, all these goodies. <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, frame.io. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. All right. So my creator's tip of the week. Um, now, uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, what, uh, there's a trend that I've been realizing, just like even in storytelling, that in times of peace, people watch war movies, and in times of war, people watch peace movies, right? And, um, and although th things have been relatively quiet, what I'm realizing is that there's been a lot of interest going into um, some little bit known before information about special operations, women in special operations. Um, and I recently wrote a short um, mm -hmm. about um, females, uh, special operations uh, officers in, in Afghanistan, in Kandahar, Afghanistan. but. Something that really inspired me, and there's a book that I want you all all to check out. Um, it's called Ashley's War, and <laughs> it's it's really good. It's actually like it's a you. really inspiring book because um, we well, and the reason why I'm also saying this because we also we um, our storyboard art artist um, Marissa Vasquez is all, is active military, and um, and just to and just to you know to see. Um, some of the hurdles and roadblocks that uh, you know special operations female officers um, and enablers working with you know like the seals and whatnot in some of these high high profile cases had to go through in order to like get in you know breaking down the, like that barrier to get in and get and get involved and like how tough they are it um, it's awesome but this book Ashley's War was actually purchased by Reese Witherspoon the rights to it and so like you're gonna be seeing um, mark my words in the next couple of years a ton of of uh, films featuring strong female protagonists having to do with what have been traditionally male roles, male dominated roles, like, you know, like the Arnold Schwarzenegger commando roles that were once like very mm -hmm. male. Um, it's almost like there's going to be a cyclical, um, you know, like we're now, I'm not saying we're going to get the 80s and 90s again, like I hope not, but, <laughs> but, uh, but there is going to be a cyclical as far as you know, like content, and it's now going to be strong females in those roles. And um, you know, we uh, we got to write that short, mm -hmm. um, the moose together for um, um, depicting all of that. And uh, I think one of the great inspirers of that was that book uh, about Ashley White, First Lieutenant Ashley White's um, life and death and her process, go you know, doing special operations. It's a great book. It's it's inspirational for any of you that are right now working on military pieces. It's really informative as far as like what goes on behind the scenes, but it's also really um, really educational, you know, with uh, what goes on in, on the field and inspiring for the for the writer. And um, and I know like there are a couple of people that were writing about that had asked me, you know, what sources I used, and so mm -hmm. I figured let me make it a, a tip of the week and talk about you know like where they can find other sources like that. 
So another part, like the second half of, of the tip um, that I have is for those of you that are writers, something that works for me is um, not just reading the analytical literature to understand time, but also some of the pleasure reading, you know, just like some um, some nonfiction and fiction. I kind of go both to just like get the historicity of what happened during, in certain eras and certain times if we're doing a period piece or with certain people if we're doing a biopic. Um, but also reading some pleasure reading about those times and places. Um, Ashley's War was kind of really inspirational for cool. me on top of even doing the research. So Cool. I wanted to uh, quickly, now that you're talking about educational pieces, um, I want to quickly throw another, uh, uh, another little tip. Um, a lot of times... Um, people are trying to figure out whether their their pieces look 3D. Oh. Um, um, and uh, there's these guys called Coral Digital. Yes. Um, and they actually break down different movies in the industry. Uh, they have a little segment called like VFX segment, and they, they, they break down different movies and why they succeeded and why they failed. And that helps a lot with trying to understand in your elements – um, you know, if this looks real or not, what what areas are challenging in the VFX world, um, and what to do about it. That's it. That's cool. So you got uh, you got a two for one. Two tip. <laughs> two tips. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, guys, that is all that we have for episode thirteen. Thank you so very much for joining us and watching the Harvest. The Harvest podcast is produced by Alana Despena, who's in the house today. Alana, welcome back. We are in post-COVID. I know she can hear me. She's hiding behind the lighting fixture. I think she uh, did cough one second. She did. So. She did. You might have heard a random <laughs> cough in the She's middle like, of here. the podcast. That was her ma- her making herself known. Pretty soon, we'll have her in a chair. Maybe we'll do like a, a little discussion talking about her experiences producing. And, and, and all that stuff and producing, too, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. That'll be fun. Um, to connect with her. Um, now, um, as far as the show notes, you're going to catch those at the bottom of the YouTube channel. We're still working on creating an actual page specifically for the podcast, for the landing page for the podcast. But for now, you can catch a lot of what all of the episodes and all of the advertising for the episodes and some special behind the scenes, never before seen footage behind the scenes on our Patreon page. Cool. So if you co- become a Patreon, you're going to be able to unlock some pretty cool BTS footage, not just of the work that we've done on location, but even some of the office behind the scenes work in order to prep for that. So if you become awesome. a patron on uh, at uh, www.patreon.com forward slash the harvest podcast you're able to go on there that's kind of serving as our landing page for now yeah. um, and for any short questions that you may have you can catch me on twitter at x garcia and I'm at Jonathan Harvest thank you guys for watching episode 13 of the harvest yes please like share and subscribe thank you thank you Join us at the patreon.com forward slash the harvest podcast for some BTS footage of our cinema production life.